again, welcome to Mosaic. Great to have you guys out here. My name is Shannon Nielsen. I'm a pastor here. Uh, we're thrilled to have you join us as we continue in our series in Matthew 8 and 9, looking at the extraordinary authority of Jesus. Uh, so far, we've been looking at Jesus' authority over demons, diseases, and death. We've looked at his authority over nature, over sin, and over us. But we haven't just looked at his authority, we've also looked at his power. His power to heal, his power to restore, his power to transform. So the question that we're wrestling with today is, do I see my need for Jesus' transforming power in my life? Do I see my need for Jesus' transforming power in my life? Regardless of whether you're a Christian or not, regardless of whether you grew up in the church, whether this is your first time in a church in years, do I see my need for Jesus' power in my life? Because if we're being honest, most of us struggle pretty deeply to recognize our need for help with anything from anyone. Especially if you're a man. Does anyone believe the cliche about men who are not willing to ask for directions? Anyone believe that at all? Any men believe that? Any wives believe that? Have you experienced that with your husband? I don't know about all of you. I do know some of you. But I know that I am that guy. I do not like to ask for directions. That's why it's wonderful to have an iPhone, because Siri can get it done for me. Siri can help me out. But before I had Siri, or if I'm not quick with my phone, or if I'm trying to get Jess to navigate, and, and she hasn't made a decision, and I just kind of, okay, we're going to go for it, then I'm taking what I assume is going to be a shortcut. And it's what Jessica constantly refers to as a long cut. She can't even stop from interrupting my sermon, you know, snickering and making jokes about me, because I'm notorious for the long cut. You know, and it's not just asking directions on the road where I've got Siri now, but even asking directions, say, at the grocery store. So this last week, um, a bunch of guys were getting together. I was picking up one of the college guys who we were going over there. He said, hey, can we stop by the grocery store? Can we pick up a few things? So we're just, just there to get two or three items. You know, it's going to be easy. Get some ice cream, get whatever. And so we get the first two items really quickly. You know, we're on a roll. We're going. And now it's time to get that third item. And Shannon proceeds to, to wander to the far end of the grocery store. You know, pretty confident that he's going to know where to find that last item. It's going to come together. It turns out that it was a long cut, just like that happened in the streets. And so, so then this college guy, me, finally, you know, he's, he's getting a little, he's feeling a little bit shy. You know, he doesn't want to be too bold. He just, he turns to me, he sees the guy who's working in the store, and I know it's the guy working in the store. But, but he notices the guy, and, and he just turns to me and, and very sheepishly asks, do you think it would be a good time to, to ask that guy, you know, where our last item is? And, and my instinctive thing in my heart is, what kind of question is that? What kind of man asks that question? Read. I'm make fun of you on Sunday morning. But then, but, but then it occurs to me that Reed is the one who's being humble, and the pastor is the one who's being proud. So, so very quickly, on the fly, in a quick, quick mind, I just say, all right, I, I better not say anything at all. You know, I, I'm not going to say, yeah, go ask the guy, that'd be embarrassing. But we're just going to let it slide. We're going to let him ask the guy, we're going to figure out where, where the beverage is that we're looking for. We're going to get this pick, thing picked up, and we're going to get out of the store. But I have a problem, I have a struggle, we call it pride, that keeps me from acknowledging my need. And in many areas of life, I struggle with that. Now, Maybe another sermon another day, I'll talk about my wife's struggles with that, since she's having a lot of fun with me. We both have that problem. No, we won't take any time for that right now. Um, but one of the things that I'm thankful for in my Christian life is that, not every day, but I feel like most days, I'm getting more and more comfortable with just owning the reality of my need for Jesus. Not just my need for Jesus in salvation, my need for Jesus in everything. My need for Jesus, for the gospel, for the Holy Spirit to continue to transform my life in every way, in every aspect. And the further I get down this journey, as much as I want to say, man, man, I'm growing, I'm moving up into the right, this is going well. All right, things are coming together, I'm really being transformed. As much as I see some of that, and as much as I want to celebrate that, there is another part of me that every day I see more and more how broken I am, how messed up I am, how needy I am how desperately I need Jesus to move in my life, and how my own power, my own resources, my own doing better and trying harder is inadequate for my need. So one of the burning questions of the Christian life is, do I see my need for Jesus? Do I see my need for grace? Do I see my need for mercy? Do I see it in my everyday life? Do I see it in my character? 
Christian or not, as I continue to move through life, every day do I see more clearly how amazing God is and how holy God is and how good God is and a contrast between who God is and who I am and how broken and how sinful and how wicked and how depraved and how needy I am. Do I see my need for Jesus? Because whether or not I see that need and how clearly I see that need will determine so much of my life. It will determine how I respond to Jesus, how I initiate with Jesus, how I see my relationship with Jesus, and how I see my relationship to his mission in the world. All right, so that's the topic that we're diving into. This morning will be in Matthew 9, 27 to 34. Really, we're going to look at two radically different responses to Jesus. On the one hand, we will see a humble, needy, broken, desperate response. On the other end, we'll see a self-righteous and proud response. All right, we'll see people who look at Jesus and they come to him with a desperate, humble faith through the gospel. And we'll see other people who respond in self-righteous pride. The same pride that comes very, very naturally to every single one of us. The pride that we are going to have to go to war with if we want any hope of really making progress in the Christian life. So I want to begin by simply reading the text. We'll go through the story, then we'll pick it apart a little bit. Matthew 9, verse 27. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David! When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, it will be done to you. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them, warned them sternly, See to it that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him all over that region. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, it's, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. In other words, he says, Jesus, sure, this is impressive, but we don't need you. We don't need to ask for directions. We don't need to ask for help. We don't need you at all. You're doing these amazing things. We've seen all of these amazing things, but we don't have any room for you in our lives. We do not want to yield to you. We do not think we need you. So we're just going to make up some lame excuse. We're going to say, oh, I'm sure that, I'm sure that there's some infighting among demons, and Satan decided he's going to drive out these demons. They make up something crazy to avoid yielding to Jesus. All right, let's start from the top. Uh, this whole section begins with two blind men following Jesus. Now, how exactly logistically they're pulling that off, I have no idea. <laughs> two blind men, I just don't know. Maybe Jesus is following a straight line. Maybe, maybe he talks a lot. Maybe they're just listening to his voice. They're, they're hearing. If you can't see, you probably figure out good ways to navigate. But it sounds logistically complicated to me, but it's what they're doing. Verse 27, as Jesus went on from there. All right, so again, throughout the series, we're looking at the context. We've seen how the pieces fit together. Went on from there. He's talking about the two miracles we looked at last week. He's talking about this woman who had had an issue of blood for 12 years, who had been bleeding, who had been an outcast, who had been completely thrown out of society, who would never come face to face with anyone, who would never ask anyone for anything because she was just too weak, too broken, too outcast. But she snuck up behind Jesus. She had just enough desperate, humble faith to grab him by the edge of his sleeve, believing that if she could just touch his clothes, that she'd be healed. We saw her faith and she was healed. The other thing we saw last week, we saw a little girl. A little girl who, who was dead. And we saw Jesus raise her from the dead. So those are the miracles last week. Again, last week, both of them emphasizing desperate, humble faith. As Jesus went on from there, from those miracles, Two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. So these guys are physically blind, but spiritually their eyesight is 20-20. They are seeing everything. All right? Other people in the story, they don't see it. The Pharisees don't see it. Matthew sets it up, this juxtaposition, this contrast. I got blind men who see more clearly than you do. That's what he wants to get, us, get across to us. That the blind men see their need for Jesus because they see who Jesus is. They don't just see him as a prophet or a miracle worker. They see him as the Messiah. 
This king who was promised in the Old Testament, not just a miracle worker, but a divine king, who would sit on the throne of David forever, their savior. So they're calling out when they ask for mercy. You gotta wonder, are they just asking for pity? Are they just asking for compassion? Or are they asking for more than that? Because that word mercy, it, it can't just mean pity. It can't just mean, hey, we can't see, we need help. But what we usually mean by mercy is that you're about to get punished. Luke and Chloe, my kids, they have misbehaved and now they want mercy. They don't want discipline. All right, they know that they deserve something bad, but they're asking, will you not give us something bad? Will you instead give us grace? Will you give us something good? Son of man, will you show us mercy? They're acknowledging that he is the coming king, that he has power and that they have need. They're picking up on what Isaiah prophesied when he wrote this. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. So these guys knew who he was, they knew their need, they knew their physical need, they knew their spiritual need, and they are begging Jesus to meet their need. They're crying out, but Jesus, he just kept on walking. Seems kind of cold. You gotta wonder, did, did he hear them calling out? Did he even notice them? Did he acknowledge them? Did he intentionally ignore them? Why would he do that? You have people crying out for mercy. You have the ability to heal them. Why would you ignore them? We're not sure. They're not sure. But they didn't let it discourage them. They said, you know what? We're blind. We're a little bit slower than the rest of the crowd. But what we can figure out, we can figure out when he goes in the house. Feet stop moving. Everybody seems to gather here. We start bumping into the crowd. All right, we're going to push through the crowd. We're going to keep on pushing. We're going to listen to his voice. We're going we're to get in there until we find him. Oh, we, we've, come to a, we've come to a wall. We've come to a doorway. We're going to push through the doorway. We don't know who owns this house, but we are coming in. We are stalking Jesus. We are seeking Jesus. We're going to find Jesus. We are going after Jesus because we need Jesus. Verse 28. When he had gone indoors... The blind man came to him, he followed right into the house, and he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Kind of a crazy question. It seems like they believe. You know, they're stalking him. I think they believe. All right, but over the last several weeks, the huge emphasis that we've been seeing, throughout the series, we've seen the power of Jesus. We've seen the authority of Jesus over everything, including over us. But it hasn't just been authority. It has also been power to transform. It's, it's been power to recreate. All right, but in, the, in last week, last week and this week, the big emphasis is not on Jesus' power. That's been established. It's not on Jesus' compassion. That's been established. We saw Luke last week. He was trying to establish that still. Matthew, he's got it established. Last week, this week, what Matthew is going for is he wants us to understand the relationship between God's power and our faith. He says, Jesus' power is available, but it is only accessible through desperate humble faith. Jesus' power is available, but it is only accessible through desperate humble faith. It is only activated by desperate humble faith. He says, we have a God who is all-powerful, who can do anything, who can heal anything, who can restore anything. We talked about it last week. It's not a car wash thing, but we know for certain that he is always going to restore we saw a woman last week who had been sick for 12 years. And some would say, well, she was sick for 12 years, and on the, on the day that it was going to be 13 years, she had faith. She put her faith in Jesus, and she was restored. Maybe. Or maybe she had faith for 12 years. And in the sovereignty of God, by the grace of God, desiring not just her physical healing, but to transform her entire person, her entire life, he allowed her to suffer. He allowed her to suffer. We don't have a blank check ticket where we always know that God wants to heal today. We know that God wants to heal eventually. We know that God wants to restore all things. But we don't know for sure that he wants to heal today. But the one thing that Matthew is pounding last week and this week is that when God moves, when God moves in power, he typically moves through faith. That his power is available, but it is only accessible, it is only activated through desperate, humble faith. And these guys have it. They obviously have it. They are calling out in the streets. They are begging Jesus to move. They are stalking Jesus. 
Because they believe, they have no doubt, that he has the ability to get the job done. But Jesus still asks them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Because he wants to emphasize their faith. Not just for us, but for them. He wants to emphasize their faith. Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and he said, according to your faith, will it be done to you? He's letting us know that genuine faith will change your life. Do you want to be changed? Some of you men, I have absolutely no doubt, in a room with this many men in it, that we have double digits of men in this room who are addicted to porn. Absolutely no doubt. Do you want to be free from that addiction? We have all sorts of sins that we struggle with. Pride that we struggle with. Envy that we struggle with. Bitterness that we struggle with. Alright? We have a lack of joy. We have sin in our lives. And Jesus comes to us and says, do you want to be free from that? Do you want to be changed? Well, a big part of that is believing that God can change you. And coming to Him desperately and humbly and saying, I want to be different. I want you to transform me and I can't do it on my own. I'm going to need your help if I'm ever going to be different. If I am ever going to change. Genuine faith can change your life. Faith is a key. That's his message. Then he touched their eyes and he said, According to your faith, will it be done to you? And their sight was restored. Then Jesus warned them sternly, See to it that no one knows about this. Why would he do that? He's done that several times throughout the series. He does that a lot in the Gospels. Why does he do that? Because Jesus is on a mission. Jesus has a very focused and particular mission. Yeah, he's here to redeem the world. He's here to die on a cross. He's here to be the substitutionary atonement for our sins. And he's here to give a foretaste of the kingdom of God, to restore all things, to take a world that's been subjected to frustration with disease and death, and to take what is subnatural and raise it back up to the natural. Not the supernatural, but the natural, what he intended to be. There's lots of facets of his mission that he is on. But the core of his mission, the core of his mission in these three years, is to do some teaching, is to do some healing, but the core is to make disciples. He's got a dozen guys, and then a little bit broader span of guys, and he's saying, I'm going to pour into these guys. I'm going to make disciples. These guys are going to be my leaders for the future. I'm hanging out for three or four years, and then I'm leaving. I'm entrusting the mission to them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour into these guys. And I'm going to tell lots of people about the coming kingdom. I'm going to reveal myself slowly to them. Then at the end, I'm going to reveal myself huge. I'm going to let the world know. And then these men, they're going to go out and leave. They're going to go out and tell people about me. They're going to take this message to the ends of the earth. So what I need to focus on now is I need to disciple these men. I'm going to teach the crowd. I'm going to heal a little bit. I don't want a huge healing ministry. All right? I will heal everyone later. What I want is to get this movement off the ground, and it's going to take discipleship. It's going to take developing a few men who will be faithful, who will be reliable. It's going to be what Paul writes about in 2 Timothy 2.2 when he says, And trust these things for reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. That was the mission that he was on. He didn't want to be distracted from that mission. So he warns them sternly, See to it that nobody knows about this. I don't need more people flooding me right now. I've got a big enough crowd. But they went out and they spread the news. About him all over the region. And you knew they couldn't keep it a secret. For maybe for their entire lives, at least for a number of years, these guys have lived in a pitch black world. Do you know what it is when you wake up in the middle of the night? Maybe you've had a bad dream, there's no full moon, there's, there's no moon at all, there's no stars coming in, there's no street lamps coming in, it is just dark. And you get up and you start wandering around. You figure out that you left your clothes there, and you trip over your clothes, and you hit your head on the dresser, and then you try to come around the corner, and you're still a little bit groggy, and you stub your toe on the, on the bottom of the bedpost, and you go out the way, and you're like, okay, I better be careful, I don't want to fall down the stairs here. But I'm blind, it is dark, I can't see anything, the power's out, whatever. They saw absolutely nothing. Sit in a room for a minute. Sit in a room when you're having conversations with people later and just close your eyes for a minute. And you know that these people might be looking at me, but I can't look at them. I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know if they're smirking at me. Oh, there's an inside joke. I missed that. 
There's a vulnerability. There's a fear. That, there's a lot of things that we lose when we lose our sight. These guys had spent their entire lives living like that, living in a world that was pitch black. And all of a sudden, they're living in a world that is vibrant. They're living in a world that is full of gardens, that is full of trees, that is full of sunsets, that is full of the faces of the people that they love that they've maybe never even seen before. You think that some stern warning is going to keep them from telling the world? Nothing like this has ever happened to them. Of course they're going to tell the world. Of course they're going to tell everyone. What else would they do? How could they be stopped? They are going to tell everyone. They're spreading the news all over the region. What else would they do? Because their lives are going to change. And if you're sitting here this morning as a follower of Jesus Christ, then I would say your life has been changed. Your life has been radically changed. So what is the difference between us and them? Because Jesus sternly warned these men, don't tell, it's not the right time to tell. But they couldn't help themselves from telling. If you read to the end of this gospel, you figure out that Jesus tells us, I want you to tell people. I want you to tell everybody. He tells them, don't go, and they go. He tells us, go, and we tend to sit here. Let me read the last three verses of the Gospel of Matthew. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority, that's what we've been talking about, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, so very in the age. He warned them, don't tell anyone, but they couldn't help themselves. He, he commands us, go tell everyone. And what do we do? Even if we believe those words, even if we look at those words and say, this is our battle cry, this is what we want to be about, we buy into the mission statement, we want to make disciples. We want to multiply passionate pursuers of Jesus Christ to engage the world with his love. That's what we talk about in this way. Even if we buy in, when we read these words, at best, what we tend to do is we stand around looking each, at each other bashfully, saying, man, how in the world can we do that? If we wanted to get the word out to our entire region, to everybody, how would we do that? What would we do? I, I don't know. I don't have a strategy. It seems kind of hopeless. These guys weren't worried about tactics. The tactics were going to take care of themselves. What they were focused on and what made all the difference was their heart. The key question here is about our hearts. Has the gospel of Jesus Christ captured our hearts? That's the question. Because if our hearts are captivated toward Jesus, captivated towards his mission, man, everything else takes care of itself. We don't sit around asking, how are we going to do this? We say, let's give it a shot. i got to tell somebody. i got to get the word out. But all of this comes back to seeing our need. If we don't see our own need, then there's no way that we're going to passionately see the need in others. Oh, we might see that they're messed up. We might see, oh, I've got my life together. You don't have your life together. Maybe you need Jesus. But it's not going to be filled with the same passion as it is if I look at my life and say, man, Jesus has transformed my life. If I don't have that passion, if I don't see Jesus changing me, I'm never going to have the passion to sacrifice everything to see him change others. I simply don't believe in the product. Bottom line, the two men, they saw their need. And it completely transformed the way they responded to Jesus, the way they pursued Jesus, and the way they proclaimed Jesus. These two blind men, they saw their need, and it completely transformed the way they responded to Jesus, the way they pursued Jesus, and the way they proclaimed Jesus. That's the big idea. But in writing this gospel, Matthew understood that most of us tend to struggle to share our faith. Most of us struggle to loudly proclaim the name of Jesus. So he tries to give us some hope in verse 32. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. When the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed. Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. So it seems like just another miracle. But when I was studying through it this week, I'm like, man, the pattern breaks down. What are you doing here? The previous three miracles, there's, there's a steady emphasis, and it's a building emphasis. And, and Matthew, he tended to group things in threes. All right, so, so I've seen this emphasis where in every one of these other miracles, we see somebody with desperate, humble faith. 
They see their need for Jesus. And we see this needy person initiating with Jesus and begging Jesus, I want you to move in my life. Then we see this guy and it's completely different. We don't see any faith. We don't see him begging Jesus. He can't even speak. We don't see him initiating with Jesus. Somebody else brought him there. We have no idea if he has any faith. We don't, we don't see any of that. So I'm like, what in the world are you putting this here for? Because it seems like an interruption. It seems like the point you want to make is down there further. What are you doing here? The more I study it, the more I came to the conclusion that this verse is there for us. When we see the response that they're telling everybody about Jesus, and we read it in the book and we, and we see our response, we tend not to tell people about Jesus. But he says, you know what? If you look at yourself and you say, I'm a person who can't speak. I'm a person who doesn't know what to say. I... Matthew wants us to know that if we think we can't speak, that God can give us the ability to speak. Throughout these parables, one of the things we see is that there is a, there's a physical, supernatural healing that's going on repeatedly. But there's often an undercurrent. There's often a metaphor. So he, he takes a little girl who is completely dead, who's physically dead, he raises her from the dead, and there is an implication that we're supposed to get that he can take those of us who are spiritually dead, which is all of us, and he can give us life. All right? We talked about the leper before. That was the first one that we saw at the beginning of chapter 8. We saw this guy who was completely unclean. That the Old Testament law actually required, because he had this contagious skin disease, that when he walked down the street, he was required to shout out, Unclean! Unclean! I'm unclean! Don't come near me! I'm contagious. You don't want anything to do with me. But what we saw with Jesus was that he took this man who was unclean, that he knew if he touched this unclean man, he would be unclean. He wouldn't even be allowed in the temple. He said, you're unclean, you know what? I'm going to touch you. Not because I need to touch you. I can say the word and you'll be healed, but I'm going to touch you. Because you're unclean. I'm going to become unclean so that you can be clean. He who had no sin became sin for us in order that we might become the righteousness of God. There was a metaphor there that he wanted us to see. And I think there's a metaphor that he wants us to see here. Alright? That, that in the moment that we should be feeling conviction that, I, that, I'm, not, that I'm not an evangelist, that I'm not boldly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the moment that we should be feeling self-conscious, maybe even guilty, about our lack of proclamation, he brings in a guy who has no ability to speak. And he says, you know what, if you think that you don't have the ability to speak, you don't know what to say, I can give you the ability to speak. I'm in that business, I can take care of that. So you can be my witness. Now some of you might say, you know, if I'm being honest, I don't really want the ability to speak. I'm not all that passionate about evangelism. Now, Shannon, I, I'm excited that you're passionate about evangelism. Somebody ought to be. I see it in the Bible. It's not my spiritual gift. All right, so it's great that you want to be passionate about evangelism. If you get somebody else fired up this morning, that'll be great too. Not me. I just don't see it going there. All right? Some of us would say this, this just isn't for me. It's not my thing. And if that's where you're at, I want you to understand, I have zero desire to guilt you into evangelism. Because if you go out of here saying, oh, that miserable pastor guy who told me that I need to tell people about Jesus, and I don't want to. I don't, you know, I don't like talking to people in general, much less talking to them about Jesus. I don't think they want to hear about Jesus. All right? If you go out of here saying, oh, but I have to because good Christians do this and I feel guilty, you're going to be a lousy evangelist. Now, it might work. If you want to try it, go ahead. Guilt evangelism, we'll, we'll give it a shot. We're back next week. Let us know. But my hunch is that's going to make you a lousy evangelist. All right, that's not God's design for how he wanted to get this thing done. What I would say is that the best evangelists are people who have been radically changed. The best evangelists are people who have been radically changed and who are being radically changed. So they can't help but tell people about Jesus. They were blind and now they see. They were addicted and now they're not. Men who look at their lives and say, you know what? I was undeniably a pervert. Now I'm, I'm pure and I have a healthy marriage and everything is good. All right, they want to tell. Maybe they don't want to tell all the dirt in the past, but, but they're excited about Jesus. So I'm going to say, okay, well, that's just it. I haven't been radically changed. I know some people have been radically changed. I heard their testimony, man, it was amazing. He was radically changed. It was awesome. Not me. I grew up in the church. I trusted Jesus at age five. It, it wasn't so radical. I wasn't really changed. You know, what, what, was your, what was your before and after story? Well, before, before, I used to be tempted to steal cookies from the cookie jar, but I was afraid I'd get in trouble, so I didn't do it. 
And now that I'm with Jesus, I'm not even tempted. And if you know me at all, you know that's a lie. I'm, I'm both tempted and I still steal it. Grace to me. The best evangelists are people who've been radically changed. Some of you will say, that's just it. I've not been radically changed. I don't have a dramatic testimony. Praise God, I'm off the hook for evangelism. Thank you. Let's, let's close in prayer. Let's be done with this message. All right? I don't think that's what he's saying. Because according to the Bible, if you are a genuine Christian, then you've been radically changed. You've been brought from death to life. That's the imagery that he uses. You've gone from an orphan to being adopted. Right? You've been brought into the family of God. You've gone from a person who, who was bound to sin. Oh, you didn't, you didn't necessarily sin as much as you could sin. You weren't as bad as you could possibly be. And maybe you didn't even notice it because you kind of liked sin. You were going down that road. But when you got to that spot where you said, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be enslaved to this sin anymore. I see it and I want to be free of it. You saw that you did not have power to be free of it. Or if you did have power to be free of it, that power came from your pride. Alright? I can muscle up and I can do better and try harder to prove that I am better than you and that's how I'm going to get over this addiction. By indulging in a new sin. Alright, but the Bible says if you are in Christ and the Holy Spirit is in you, then there is a power to be free from sin. And it is slow and it is arduous and it is hard. But if you are a Christian, then you've been radically changed and you are in the process of continuing to be radically changed. And what we're going to see next week is that that radical change should drive us to share faith. But I want to explain it a little bit more. I want to explain that change. So I'm going to put together a couple of charts. I just want to walk through you. These are based on, um, I don't know, it's a great book. We did a study on it. I can't remember what it's called. Help me out. Gospel-Centered Life. Life. It's great. Next time we offer that class, we want this. The charts are good. Hopefully the explanation will be good as well. Okay. Here's how most of us experience a Christian life. Who knows what life was like before Jesus, but eventually you come to that moment where you surrender your life to Jesus. You bow your knee before, you came, before the king. It's called conversion. All right? You get to that point where you acknowledge, I'm sinful. You are holy. I need you. I've been doing better. I've been trying harder. I've been trying to get this thing together. And there is a gap, and I cannot bridge the gap, and I need you. I'm surrendering my life to you. I'm placing my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not going with my righteousness anymore. I'm trusting in his righteousness to redeem me, to save me, to transform me. All right? That is conversion. If you are a Christian, there is a moment in your life when you came humbly and acknowledged your need. That I am broken, I am sinful, I need a Savior. If you have never done that, and I, I don't mean to be difficult, I don't mean to be insulting, I don't mean to be argumentative, but scripturally, biblically, if you've never humbled yourself before Jesus and said, I am not good enough, I need you, then you're not a Christian. Alright, that is part of the entrance into the kingdom of God, that I place my faith in Jesus Christ. I place my faith in his righteousness, not my own. I put my hope in the gospel. Not that I can be good enough, but that Jesus lived the life that I was supposed to live. That Jesus died the death I deserve to die, and I place my faith in him, I trust in him. And I come to him, and I'm received by him, not because of what I've done or who I am, but in spite of what I've done and who I am. All right, I come to God by grace through faith, seeing my desperate need for God. Where do we go from there? How do we experience our need for Jesus' transforming power as we grow in Christian life? I would say that too often we don't. All right, we get off to a good start, we're excited, we start changing some things. You know, I want to follow Jesus. This is what my Jesus-following friends do. I'm going to follow like this. Maybe there's some genuine faith there. Maybe there isn't. All right, but I start changing. I start getting some things out of my life. The bad things I used to do, I don't do as much. All right, the habits that I used to have, I seem to be breaking them. I'm moving forward. And I look at my life and I say, well, you know what? My life is going up and to the right. All right, I'm, I'm getting my life together. I'm growing in Christ. I'm maturing. And then I look at all the people around me. And I have this incredible temptation to look at them and say, you know what? They are right where I left them. Or those people are worse than where I left them. My life's growing. I'm becoming a good Christian. I'm getting my life together. These guys, bring the next chart up there. These guys, they're underperforming. I don't really relate to them. All right, this is the path of religion. Self-improvement through legalism, through being a good person, by getting my life together, by doing better and trying harder. I felt guilty about the sermon, so, so I'm going to do better and try harder. I'm going to try to get my life together. And it cultivates pride. Because when I do perform well, I see that, man, I'm better than them. 
I've got my life together. The cross gets smaller. My need for Jesus gets smaller. My pride gets bigger. My pride is fed by my performance. When I am doing well, when I'm performing well, I look at other people and I say, man, I'm better than you. When I'm not performing well, well, that's when I pretend. That's when I conceal. That's when I hide the truth. Because I can't let you know how messed up I am. My identity depends on outperforming you. And I look around and, and I see some of the other people and I see that their identity seems to depend on outperforming me. And we get together and we talk about the people who are performing badly. Alright? It creates a culture where when I do sin, and you will sin, and I will sin, and I do sin, where we have to pretend. And we can't be open with each other. We can't. We can't be real with each other. And on our best days, all we have is a religious worldview. Which says that I'm getting better and you're getting worse. And my best hope is that I can be better than you. How does that affect our proclamation of the gospel? How does that affect our proclamation of the gospel? Go ahead and put that chart back up there. What do I have to proclaim? Who do I have to proclaim to? Because if I'm on that green line, I'm somebody who's going up and to the right. These other guys, they're going down. Frankly, these are the people that I don't want to associate with. Because when I look at my life, I think we can all agree that I'm better than them. Why would I even associate with them? Why would I want to live in their neighborhoods? Why would I want to spend time with them? They don't even vote the way that I vote. It's all fed by pride, all right? It drives me away from associating with those people. Because my very identity is coming from the disparity between me and them. Real or imagined. All right? Besides that, what would I be proclaiming? Why would I proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ when the further I get into this performance-driven faith, the smaller the cross gets, the smaller Jesus gets, and the bigger I get? All right? I don't even have a message to share in that scenario. So what's the alternative? How do I truly grow in the Christian life? Bring up the next chart. Growing awareness of God's perfect holiness. That's what's going up. That's what's growing. Growing awareness of my depravity and my need for grace. And at every stage in the process, as I see God more clearly, as I see how good He is, how holy He is, how perfect He is, as I see how far I fall short, my need for grace, my need for the cross, my need for the righteousness of Jesus grows. My appreciation for what Jesus did for me grows. As every day I bathe my mind in the gospel. Every day I rehearse the reality that I brought nothing to the table and that Jesus brought everything to the table and that I desperately need him. And transformation looks differently. When I get the gospel, I realize that I am more wretched and sinful than I ever dared believe, and yet at the same time, I'm more loved and accepted than I ever dared hope. All right, and when I look at transformation, I do want to grow. I do want to become more holy. I look at my daddy and I say, I want to be like daddy. I look at my God and I say, I want to be like God. I want to get my life together. He's given me the Holy Spirit to empower me to transform me. I want to get out of the way. I want to, I want to yield to that. I want it to transform me. All right, so as we grow in the Christian life, we should see more love. We should see more joy. We should see more peace and patience and kindness and goodness and, and all those things through the Spirit. We should see more self-control in our lives. We should expect that. But the larger part of growth is in perspective. It's seeing, man, I'm nothing. I'm nothing in my own performance. I'm nothing on my own. But I have been accepted. I have been adopted. I have been loved. I'm not going to find my identity in doing better and trying harder. I'm going to find my identity in the God who loves me. In the God who died for me. In the God who adopted me. And at every stage in this process, the cross of Christ gets bigger. And my proclamation becomes more bold because I have something better than me to proclaim. And I'm out of the way. And I'm excited about Jesus and I want people to know about Jesus. That is the Christian life. That is what God wants to drive us toward. Through the gospel, I grow every day in my awareness of my need for Jesus. By His grace, my pride diminishes and my compassion grows, and over time, I develop a powerful testimony. 
Not of my performance, and, and not even necessarily of how I've changed, but of who God is, and of what God has done for me, and how He has loved me in spite of me. How He steadily helped me to put death to myself, death to my pride, and to find new life through the gospel. So which path are you on? Which path am I on? Are you on a path where every day you are more clearly seeing your need for Jesus Christ? Or are you on a path that's so distracted from Jesus and so focused on your own performance, your own needs, your own identity apart from God, that you wouldn't even think about talking about the gospel? What's the gospel? What's it matter? That's something that's for new Christians, non-Christians, it's not for me. When the reality is the gospel is for all of us, it is the thing that drives all of us forward in the Christian life. Do I come to Jesus humbly saying, heal me, give me life, open my eyes, give me ears to hear, give me words to speak, overcome my self-destructive habits, overcome my foolishness and my pride, recreate me into the man that you desire me to be? Or do I come to Jesus in pride saying, you know, frankly, I know that I'm good enough. Some of those other people they might, might not be good enough, but, but I'm good enough. I've always been good enough. I can get this thing done. If we're coming to God in pride, we've got to seriously question, man, am I even a Christian? The gospel requires humility and it cultivates humility. And at the very least, even if you place your faith in Jesus without humility, without seeing my need for Jesus, we're never going to grow. And every single day of my life, instead of enjoying a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm going to feel the overwhelming burden of performing and of proving that I'm good enough. And when I fall short, I'm going to feel an overwhelming burden to cover up the truth. Because I can't let people know that I've fallen short of being good enough. How do we respond to Jesus with humility or pride? As we close, I just want to look at the last verse here in this section. So Jesus healed the blind man. Jesus healed the man who couldn't speak. And the crowd was amazed. Not just at these, but at everything we've covered so far in the series. They said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. We've never seen anything like it. He has to be the Messiah. Verse 34. But the Pharisees said, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. So the crowds are amazed. They see the extraordinary authority of Jesus. They call out with the blind men, Have mercy on us, son of David. The Pharisees, who knew the Old Testament better, who should know exactly who Jesus was, exactly what Jesus was doing, they should be able to interpret all of it and see it more clearly than anyone. They said, you know what? We have no room for him in our lives. We are self-sufficient. We are self-righteous. We do not need him. We do not want him. We will make something up. We will do anything to get rid of Jesus. Each of them says to Jesus, man, I see what you're doing. I see who you are. I see the prophecies. I see you fulfilling the prophecies. But I'm not willing to yield to you. So I'm going to find a reason to go avoid you. Because I think that I am more than good enough all my life. The Pharisees failed to see their need because they failed to grasp the gospel. Pharisees failed to see their need because they failed to grasp the gospel. And they were good people. You read through the gospels, the Pharisees get ripped on constantly, but they were good people. They were law-abiding people. They weren't like me. They see the last cookie in the cookie jar, they're leaving it. They're, they're giving it to somebody else because it's the right thing to do. Not me, I'm eating the cookie. These guys are good people. Yeah, a little self-righteous, a little proud. Not very fun to be around if you're not a good person. But they were high-performing good people. They were amazing little boy scouts. They were eagle scouts. But Jesus is not in the business of making eagle scouts. He's in the business of making worshipers. He's in the business of making missionaries. He's in the business of making people who will passionately pursue him from the heart. And there are thousands of ways to clean up your life. There are thousands of ways to do better and try harder. There are thousands of ways to become a good person. You can become a great person without Jesus. At least in your outward performance. You can look great on the outside. But you cannot be transformed from the inside out without Jesus. Alright? Without the power of the gospel to humble you. To humble me. And if we go any other route, we're going to have to put on a facade. We're going to have to pretend. And sooner or later, that facade's going to break down. Our pride is going to rise to the surface and it's going to show. 
And I think one of the first ways that our pride is going to show is in our lack of compassion for the people who are far from Jesus. For the lack of compassion to the people who are outside these walls, for the lack of the people who are trying to come in. Alright? That's why next week, Jesus, as we wrap up this series, Jesus is going to be talking about mission. He's going to be sharing his compassion for a lost and dying world. And he's going to be calling us to pray and calling us to mobilize to love the people around us. Because gospel humility drives us for the mission. That's where we'll pick up next week. Let's pray. God, I pray that you'd humble our hearts. I pray that you'd humble my heart. It is discouraging sometimes to see how often my pride comes to the surface in the course of the day. And God, I believe it would be even more discouraging if I saw it more clearly. But Lord, it is incredibly encouraging to know that you love us anyway, that you accept us anyway, that you make yourself available to empower us anyway. Lord, in spite of our sin, in spite of our failure, Lord, you have loved us. God, I pray for those who are here today who have a genuine relationship with you. Lord, I know that all of us in that boat are in a situation where we drift and where we have no doubt drifted to some degree from where you want us to be. God, would give us hearts that see your gospel more clearly, that see our need more clearly, that fall on our, fall on our faces before you. Would you give us hearts of repentance, Lord, that are so humble and so forgetful of ourselves that we can repent of our sins to each other, that we can share our brokenness, that we can celebrate our brokenness and the grace that we've received and our need for you. God, I pray for those who, are, who have not crossed the line of faith. Maybe they think they have, maybe they know that they haven't. Who have not humbled themselves before you and said, you know what, I'm not good enough. God, I pray that there would be an atmosphere here that is safe and where vulnerability just seems like the natural place to go. God, I, more than that, I pray that you would move by the power of your Holy Spirit and humble hearts now. That we would surrender our lives to you. Lord, that those who have never surrendered their life to you would. Lord, that you would give a willingness to discuss those things even today after the service. God, I pray for those who are here for the first time, Lord. Um, whether they understood the message, whether it was all confusing, God, I pray that we would just love them well. Um, Lord, that we would love as you love, that we would welcome as you welcome. And God, I pray those who are here for the first time would find us to be a family. And they'd be eager to join the family once in a while. Amen. Thanks a ton for coming out. We will see you next week.